Welcome, 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 welcome. How's everyone doing today? Woo! Woo! Yeah, all right, great. It's gonna be a wonderful crowd today. <laughs> um, welcome to SEP 311, uh, the Serverless Remediation and Financial Services, a custom tool. I didn't make the title, someone else did. Um, welcome to our presentation. Uh, I will tell you that I'm gonna do my best to give you a most exciting slide-based presentation that hopefully you'll remember for ages to come, but you tell me afterward whether I've accomplished that or not, all right? Um, so first, let me introduce myself. Um, my name is Kyle Sheldon. I am the cloud, uh, director of cloud security at Discover Financial, and uh, we have stood up a cloud security program over the last two years from the very beginning, from the very earliest stages, right? And I think our origin story is very important uh, to understand how we got to where we are today with the development of some of our tools. So it first started, I have, why am I important? Why do I think I'm important? Why am I up here speaking to all of you? Um, I've worn many hats uh, at Discover. I've been there for 13 years. I've been everything from a QA tester to an application developer, to a systems administrator in middleware, to a systems designer in infrastructure, to a solution architect in both uh, infrastructure and, and security. And when I joined security out of my solution architecture job, architecture job, the first thing my boss said is, you're going to be our cloud security architect. And I had spent seven years building out servers in a traditional data center. And my first question to him, who's sitting, he's sitting in this front row right here, was, I, what is the cloud? What do I do there? So as part of being a cloud architect for Discover, a cloud security architect for Discover, I had to work with many folks in infrastructure and our application development spaces. We got a feel for what we wanted to do out there. We wanted to definitely move our security tools out there, but there are also some certain, certain threat vectors we wanted to, um, wanted to uh, attack and uh, get uh, some controls around. And so I, we, we came up with this approach. We tried to forklift things over. And when you forklift your controls over, uh, well, you know, it's 2019, it doesn't really work that well. You take these traditional on-prem approaches, whether it's a, a tool or a, a program or a piece of security software, you try to migrate it to the cloud and you hope you get the same level of control and benefit and value from it, and you really don't get it. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that. There's plenty of conversations and other presentations here at the conference I think you can go to to get more information on that. What it really came down to was we identified that we needed a way a new approach to how we did our security in the cloud. Um, so uh, this is gonna be the story of that, uh, how we stood up our program, how it led to our serverless remediation platform. We're gonna talk about DevOps just a little bit um, and why we think it should empower cybersecurity just as much as it does empower our development teams. Uh, we'll also speak on the problem of security misconfiguration We'll talk about our approach, how we set up our cloud security program, some of the tenants our delivery and development teams in security live by as they develop their tooling. And then we'll talk about our product and serverless remediation using all cloud native tools. This is an AWS conference. I'm gonna tell you a lot about AWS tools and microservices and APIs. And then we're gonna talk about a little bit about the future, where we think it's going, how AWS is helping, and where we think our little development community is going to grow into. So with that, I guess we'll get started with the whole presentation. So we start talking DevOps in the cloud. Everything you read about is that development uh, teams can get so much out of the cloud. The microservices approach to the cloud makes it so easier for them to accomplish things like better speed, right? The, uh, with continuous deployment, teams own their services. They release their, they release their workloads and infrastructure uh, quicker and, more, uh, and uh, are allowed to make updates in, at a faster cadence. Um, from a delivery standpoint, they increase their frequency. They, get a, they can set their pace of releases to meet their business need. This leads to improving their product faster using things like continuous integration, continuous deployment strategies. They also get things that they can automate and make it even faster. When we talk reliability, because they're doing all this automated, uh, they get the uh, quality of application updates and the quality of infrastructure changes. CICD, again, lets them test each change. And then on the scaling side, they can manage their infrastructure and their dev processes at scale using things such as infrastructure as code. So when, when we started our cloud program, we had to figure out exactly how we wanted our teams, our delivery teams, our application teams, to have this type of value add for the workloads they were doing. 
we've the traditional process of a security assessor coming in, looking at a design from a solution perspective way at the end of the development process, try to do a deep dive assessment, give 60 to 90 days to go fix it, wasn't going to scale for the business if they were going to get this type of empowerment in the environment. So we had to take another look at it. And what we coached, what we marketed as we went around our enterprise was that the same things that empower our development community in the cloud should also empower our cybersecurity programs. The same exact reasons, right? If we, change, if we transform cybersecurity to building some of these homegrown tools, we can accomplish the same speed, deliverability, reliability, and scaling that our, that our actual business development teams were doing. And on top of that, the cloud providers such as AWS, they provide great things um, in regards to cybersecurity microservices. Inventory is an excellent example of this. If I want an exact idea of every resource I have in any individual AWS account, it is a simple API call, as everyone here is well aware. I get better logging. I get things like API logs so I know what's happening in the data center. If I would ask anyone who has a traditional data center today what changed in your environment last night, I don't think anyone could give me a really good answer. You might have some change management programs. You might have some ticketing programs that might tell you what was scheduled to be done, what was successful. But I worked in infrastructure for six or seven years. I know that when I, when I had that change window of two hours, I know what outcome we got. But I know I, I did not necessarily have to follow that implementation plan step by step to get there. Things happen at 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. in the morning where you just have to get stuff done, right? The difference in the cloud with logging and things like CloudTrail is I can identify exactly what you did via the API log event in CloudTrail, what resource you're changing, what you're trying to do, and I can map your behavior through that. That is a big step up over what I get in the traditional data center today. Now, we couple that with some other microservices, and we'll talk about more about that in the product in a, little bit, in a little bit, but I can now do enhanced monitoring. I can start thinking of things like a security event bus, and then I can start looking at compliance in a whole new way, too. I can look at compliance and going, hey, if I can do event-driven testing at the time of deployment, at the time of change, can I tell my auditors, we are financial services, can I tell my auditors, my regulators, that I'm trending towards compliance? without having to take a snapshot every time, because that snapshot, obsolete as soon as we take it. So with that approach, we knew we had to take this different approach, and this is what we built it on. When we looked at the cloud and our workloads there, we were looking at building out a big, large analytical data lake out there. On the security side, there was one thing, one thing I was so concerned with. It was this. I do not want to be on the news. I don't mind being on stage right now talking to all of you, but I don't want to be on the news in any way, shape, or form, right? And so this is just a search of, over some uh, security misconfiguration uh, pra uh, malpractices that you can see out there. January 2019, some company left mortgage and credit documents open to the world. Uh, in, same in January, records contain very sensitive PII, social security numbers, phones, addresses, credit histories. We jump to February 2019, Personal contact information from millions of Instagram. Ooh, that should not talk about that one. April 2019, 540 million records detailing comments like reactions and account names. And then in May 2019, highly sensitive source code, credentials, secret keys for several internal projects. We do not want our customers' data to be in any way, shape, or form publicly accessible like this. We care about our customers. We care about our customers' data. We are customer obsessed like that and we had to make sure we had accurate controls in place to prevent this, or at least detect and respond to it as quickly as possible. And so we built something for that. Before we built it, we had to identify the approach. So I went to my management and I said, listen, as an architect, I think we have to do something better. Our traditional programs may not be, uh, have evolved at the rate that we need to. We need to establish a new program. We need, it needs to take things like DevSecOps and, and uh, apply it to our cloud environments and really stand up almost a new sort of cybersecurity practice. And, these, and what we did is we looked at the cloud adoption framework by AWS. And they are in, a part of the CAF, there is a security perspective white paper. Highly recommend you read it. What we did is we took the parts out of there that we liked the most and we built the four tenants 
that every single member of my delivery team today lives and dies by as they approach every problem, cybersecurity problem in the cloud. So number one, on the directive side, I always want to have an answer as to why we're doing something. I want to have a strategy. I want to be able to lean on something as a, as a basic approach. And number one, what we learned very quickly was we need to use the cloud to protect the cloud. The days of forklifting that existing control over and assuming I'm getting that value out, long past gone, right? Our cybersecurity programs in the cloud didn't start really evolving until we adopted the cloud ourselves. And we live that today. We always look at cloud native first when it comes to our cybersecurity products and compare that to anything in the open source or the commercial marketplace, right? The second one was guardrails and not gates. We wanted to ensure that development teams had the confidence to build out their tools and their workloads in the way they wanted to. And that meant we can't come in and say no all the time. We have to define guardrails. We have to define guardrails so that the developer can actually move forward and deploy their resources, and they do it without any notification from us, that they can assume that they did it the right way, and they did it in a secured fashion. Ultimately, we wanted the easiest way for a developer to do something to be the secured way. Because I tell you, after all my inter interactions with developers and things I've done myself, developers don't read. We don't copy and paste very well. We definitely don't like reading documentation, right? So I could go write a whole bunch of things about how you need to write an S3 bucket policy. I could write an S3 bucket policy of how to harden it as much as you want and, and ask the developer to do a control, a control V, uh, a find and replace, replace parameter one with the name of yourself, and they wouldn't do it. We would get brought in, uh, we would get consulting, we would, we would spend an hour meeting with that developer to educate them on how to write a secure bucket policy or what, why, it's, why it's a concern that your RDS database goes public. This is not scalable. We have a large enterprise, 1,900, I believe, um, employees in, business, in our business technology area. And if, if I assume that every one of them was a cloud developer, there's no way I can meet with them that many times in a week. So we needed a better way. And that's the guardrails and not the gates. All right, this third thing was something very important to us was that security leads by example, right? If I'm talking to development teams and I'm saying we're a development team and we're telling that you have to use things like CICD, you have to concern, you have to concern yourself with things like security, you have to name your things correctly, you need to do automation pipelines, you should do uh, a regression testing, you should have that testing inside of your pipelines. We had to show that it could be done. We wanted to lead by example. This was phenomenal. Right? It challenged our delivery teams to think like developers, do it the right way, and also lead our enterprise in that fashion. What came out of this was I did not have developers or engineers on our team that were commercial marketplace administrators. They were cloud security engineers. They didn't start that way. I had a SIM administrator and a Java developer who had eight years, eight, who had a decade worth of experience and we transformed them to cloud security engineers. Because we built stuff in the cloud, we led by example, and we apply the technologies and the practices we've already learned. The fourth one was supporting the infrastructure as code practice. When we start talking DevSecOps and the tooling you're gonna see in, in application pipelines, it was critical that we, as we're if we're leading the uh, enterprise by example, we had to support that IAC approach. Right? When we start talking preventive controls, which is the next tenant there, it needs to be infrastructure as code. That seems to be the only way or one of the few ways I can get preventive code analysis done to ensure that things are configured correctly in our cloud environment. Moving on to the preventive side, we want to ensure that anomalies in the environment from a configuration perspective are prevented. This was very difficult for our use case. Raise of hands in the audience today, who uses CloudFormation? All right, who uses something other than CloudFormation? All right, so if my development teams, and for those who's just watching on YouTube, I have about half and half in the room. If I made a control or an application or a code scanning tool for CloudFormation to ensure that your resources were compliant to our baselines, you would walk around that by using your other tool, right? The preventive, uh, the preventive controls were gonna be very difficult for us to do in our environment as well. It was our first cloud adoption, or really our first cloud migration. 
we didn't know what our development teams wanted to do. But if I go back to what DevOps is, they should be given the freedom to use whatever language, encoding language or tooling, whatever they want, to deploy their resources in the cloud based on their skill level, based on what they want to accomplish. So we identified quickly on that, putting our controls in the preventive side, where they could be easily walked around, not exactly a recipe for success, All right? And then what we said there is if you're gonna do that, we should at least be looking at security test harnesses and pre-deployment. I would say mostly on the preventive side, this is a lot of stuff we're working on today. This is really a culture of practice type of thing, and it takes a while for that to take hold. So we knew we couldn't do well preventive checks. So we focused all of our efforts on detection and response. If my detection and response is so quick, it feels like a preventive control, and I had some even argue that it actually is because it happens so quick, then we've done our job. Think of it as like a catch-all at the bottom of a firewall rule, right? We're gonna catch everything that happens no matter how it went out there. We wanna respond to it. We'll worry about changing the culture a little bit later by putting the preventive checks in. So on the detective side, we want total visibility. I wanna be able to see everything. I want everything so I can respond to it. With that, I want near real-time configuration monitoring. The traditional approaches of saying, let's go grab our inventory of 900 servers, go do a check to see what vulnerabilities they have on them, and then go reach out to the owners of those things and have them go fix it is obsolete when they can go spin up 900 servers right after I take the report. It just doesn't work. I need a better way. I need a guardrails, not gates approach. I need an event-driven approach. This takes us back to the response side. This, if I can set up a security event bus that gives me the detective visibility that I need, I can start doing things like scalable incident response. I can have automatic configuration self-healing. I can respond for stuff, I can respond to things for our SOC, for our uh, operations analysts. I can even enrich that data before they get it so they don't have to go gather it all. If I have that visibility, I could do so much to empower them so they can spend their time doing more important things. And then I get that security feedback. Oh, oh, there we go. Uh, I can get the security feedback, not just to our SIM and our SOC and everything else, but to our actual developers. The point of DevSecOps, in my opinion, the shift left approach is to get security feedback and information into the developer's hands so they can make security educated decisions. This is key. I'll tell you a little bit of story of what happened when we implemented the tool here. But we put, the, we put a, uh, a tool in place to remediate bad configurations in the environment. We did not reach out to the developers and told, tell them we were doing this. I had one unfortunate offshore person who stood up, I believe, 55 RDS instances in an eight-hour period. He logged into his environment, was also happy about it, learned his AWS, stood up his RDS DB instances, and he left encryption off. We had a control in place that said, ah, sorry, pal, you need encryption turned on. And so we would terminate the instance. Because at the time, AWS did not let you change your encryption option um, at the t after you provisioned the instance. So this poor SAP man, for eight hours, he would run his infrastructure as code, he'd get a success back, he'd go log into the console to go verify his instance was up, and we had already turned it off. Right? And we get an email in the morning and we're like, oh man, we gotta help this guy out. We gotta get some notification in their hands, let them know what we're doing. I, did I just make shadow IT? This ain't good. I, I don't know if I should be doing shadow IT as, a, as part of the security organization. So we immediately went, ran to our notification and said, this security feedback is important. So we'll get to a little bit more on that. So as we built the tool, the first thing we do as developers is we, you know, we, we go to the whiteboard. Let's talk about the experience we want. So we have a multi-account strategy. Again, we have 1,000, 1,500 developers, whatever it is. And uh, they're each gonna get uh, uh, their own AWS cloud account. In that account, they are going to provision resources. It could be an S3 bucket for object storage. It could be a database on RDS. It could be an overly, it could be a security group rule. It could be a uh, elastic block storage or file or elastic file system, EFS. It could be any of those things. What, we, what we're saying is, I don't know if it's, it's something we built, but you can go out to the uh, vendor hall here and you can find a slew 
of awesome products that do this as well, right? But you need some sort of compliance engine. This engine, you want to feed that data into. We want that, that API event. We want that, that resource that was just provisioned. We want to pass that information to the compliance engine, at least notify it that something new has popped up in the environment. After that, what we want that compliance engine to do is pull the metadata for that resource. We want it to perform a compliance test to our baselines. If the baselines are good, if there's, if there's no discrepancies between the baselines and what the user has put out in the cloud, everything's okay. It turns into a green box like you see on the screen there. Everything's good. Now, what if it's bad? Well, if it's bad, if I'm already there, I'm already testing this at the, at, very, at the very end of the provisioning, I have a unique window here where I can do some cool things. Why don't we try to fix it? If I know what's wrong, and I'm a security team, and I've had feedback from developers who tell me, if you know something's wrong, and you know how I need to fix it, go fix it. Why are you waiting for me to do it? Right? So we try that. So if we can fix the problem of the configuration of the resource, we need the compliance engine to do that. Everything's good afterward. Now, if we still can't, because there are certain niche cases, perhaps you've locked yourself, your resource out of uh, the compliance engine's coverage, or perhaps it's a configuration item that can't be changed at runtime or after it's been provisioned, terminate it. Go Draconic on it. And we can do this because it's at the time of provisioning. We're not interrupting the business. We're not interrupting a business workload here because it's provisioning that resource right then and there. We can travel along with that change window and remove that resource. We have to be very careful that we don't do things like termination on things that are running and active for the disruption of our business. And we do a very, in my opinion, we do a very awesome job of making sure that that doesn't happen. After the end of all of this, we want to send the results to one, we want to send it back to the developer. In DevSecOps, we want to establish this culture of practice. We have to give them the security information up front. So we send them, an e we want an email or some chat, op or some, some, some chat ops notifications to go out that will tell the developer exactly what went wrong, what they did, why it's important, teach security at the time of it happening. On the other side, we want that compliance test to go to our uh, security operations analysts so they can know, because this is behavior, right? If they see someone uh, trying to do the same thing 10 times and it's, inconfigured, it's misconfigured every time, this could be a security incident and they need to be notified of such. So both the compliance engine is just is, is, a, is a control for our developers, but it is also a control, it's also valuable data for our operations analysts. All right, that's the whiteboard. What's it look like in all the cool AWS logos and everything else? Here's what it looks like. So on the left, I have users. These users will provision things in the AWS cloud environment whether it be an analytics resource like Kinesis, uh, Redshift, it could be a database with RDS or, or DynamoDB. On the network side, it could be things like uh, security groups and security group rules. On the security and IM, it could be they're provisioning themselves roles, and we want roles to have a certain level of permission boundaries on them, utilizing all the various tools we have at AWS to do so, or it could be storage, whatever it is. We want that uh, API event to be logged in CloudTrail, and it should be. It should, your CloudTrail should be turned on in all of your accounts. And what we do is we set up an Amazon CloudWatch uh, pair to look at the event. We create an event that grabs that uh, API event in the log and a rule that says, when you see this, go kick off this Lambda job. This Lambda function will reach out to those various resources, pull the data in, perform the compliance test against it, and then hand it off to our notification Lambda to hand it to cybersecurity resources or back to our users. Simple enough. The, the pair of Amazon CloudWatch and AWS CloudTrail gives us our security event bus in the cloud. This was mind-bogglingly ahead of what we had in our traditional data centers. I don't know if I really truly have a security event bus like that in my traditional data center, but I could do it here in the cloud because of the microservices that AWS provides us. All right, so cool. What's it look like to the user? Well, I have an awesome set of engineers on our team, and they pride themselves on things like their cloud security knowledge and everything else. What they pride themselves the most on is their ASCII art. 
So internally, we call this tool Warden. Uh, you know, we were looking at our users as maybe, you know, uh, uh, incarcerated or some sort, and we were the warden making sure that whatever resource they put in jail was actually configured correctly. Um, in, as you can see in this email, uh, we tell them exactly what happened. Your AWS resource is not compliant, and we modified it for you. Right? In this case, uh, this was myself at another demo. Uh, I was trying to create an RDS instance. It's a little hard to read, I think, in the crowd, but it, it says I created a DB instance, and I made it public. So our remediation message with the second bullet point at the bottom there says uh, there's been an instant violation. It's publicly accessible. Our remediation act, uh, action is that we terminate the instance. At the bottom of this email message, we also provide the full CloudTrail API event so they can look it up in their own logs. In addition, we provide links that go straight to our documentation. Now, not documentation that takes them to our wiki page where they have to go search up what went wrong. The actual link in the documentation to the actual test case that they failed on, complete transparency, how we tested it, the pseudocode of how we do it, why it's important. I don't know why I have to explain to developers why public databases are important, but that's it, there. And um, we, we just want to be transparent and give them all the information they need. Also, we provide links to our support channel so they can reach out to us immediately if they have any questions. This was great for us. We got great developer feedback on this. Our delivery teams had to learn a little bit, though. Uh, we had some different use cases that weren't uh, resonating with our development community. One of the few ones I remember was our security group rules. So we had a, a rule in this tool that said, if you make an overly permissive security group, an any-to-any -any security group rule, right? We would, our remediation message was, you have an overly permissive layer four policy in your security group rule. Reach out to developers, and the first thing they would ask me was, I don't know what overly permissive layer four permission rule looks like or what that is, right? So we had to reach out to them and understand what language we had to translate it in for it to resonate with them. And that's part of good agile practices and everything else, and so we follow that to the best of our ability. But it really showed us that when we design a security tool, Sometimes we are the primary customer in security. It has to serve our needs. But in DevSecOps, when we want to reach out to the development community, they need to accept it as well. And we have to keep, their, we have to keep them in mind when we build our tools. All right. So we have a multiple account strategy. We have 60 plus AWS accounts today. It's only going to scale up, I imagine. How does this work in that, in that sort of landscape? You usually go to a multi-account strategy for blast radius control and centralized billing. You want to make sure that if one account gets popped, your whole, your whole account fleet does not. AWS provides great services to help you organize that. AWS organization is one of those things. But for us, we had to figure out how we make this Lambda, Lambda CloudWatch platform roll out to the rest of our enterprise, the rest of our accounts. Things to consider when you do that. You can go look on open source today. You'll find a lot of projects that do the same thing. Um, but they all change how they do it in multi-account. You have to ask yourselves, if you're going to build this yourself, what components you want to centralize? What components do you want to centralize and keep, pr keep protected with your blast radius? For us, we chose to centralize our notification and distribute all of the remediation Lambda functions to each individual account. This ensured for us that if the account was ever disconnected from our environment or whatnot, that it, the protections would still be in place, right? And you have to understand what components you want to distribute. And you want to keep uh, mindful of the five new boundaries out in the cloud. Your network, which is a, a traditional perimeter, your data perimeter, your compute perimeter, your messaging, and your identity perimeters. How you feel about how you want to protect those will certainly influence how you create or build like this for yourselves um, uh, with your security programs. Now, when you start talking multi-account, dis distributing the same level of code or the code build to multiple areas or multiple environments, you have to talk automation. So for us, we identified that we needed an account bootstrap. Our infrastructure teams at Discover built a great tool that automates our account generation. We ensured that we were part of that pipeline so that when they create a new account, it hands it, up, hands it to us. We go in and install all of our Warden components, all of our components there to make it work. 
That's one use case, to make sure that every new account comes out of the factory with our security controls in place. The second thing we had to do was worry about what if I had to make changes to those guardrails or those policies? What if I create a new module? What if I further restrict the policy? I need to be able to distribute that across multiple accounts as well. So we created a pipeline to do that. And the one thing we noticed after all of that was, yay, a little reliability engineering going on here. We had to know what versions of code we had running in every environment to make sure it was stable and running the latest and greatest things. We're in financial services. I think in 2019, I've had one week break from being audited or uh, being looked at. So documentation is good. And for us, the component visibility helped us immensely with that. We were able to show exactly how reliable our controls were, what versions we had running, and it's something you need to consider if you build this out yourself. And then for us, it was everything as code. We wouldn't have done this without everything as code. We want to lead by example. So if we're telling the rest of the enterprise, you got to write everything as code, we better damn well do it ourselves as well. So the infrastructure is code. It's all written in uh, Terraform. And we have a full pipeline for that with some other orchestration tools to roll it out. Our remediation as code is written in Python. Our policy as code is also written in Python. And our documentation, uh, not exactly with code, but we have documentation that details how, our, how you step through our code and how we do the test. Again, frequently looked at, have to show people what we're doing, have the documentation ready to do so. All right. So when we start talking multiple account distributions, here's just a few examples of how that might look. You can really move these pieces in any way, shape, or form you really want based on what you want to accomplish with your blast radius and your isolation goals. On the left side, it's more of a local account distribution. You still need the two things I talked about. You still need an IAC distribution pipeline. And you still need an account factory to ensure that new accounts have all your controls in it. But in this way, that those pipelines will roll out to every account in the organization, create the events and the rules, create the remediation uh, Lambda functions, and create the notification Lambda functions. And all of your time and effort is going to be based on that pipeline to ensure that those things are consistent across your environment. This gives you a, a really independent look at getting your controls in place into all of the, uh, all the different accounts. Now, that sometimes gets unmanageable. So you can do some more of a centralized account distribution. You still need your uh, IAC, your infrastructure as code pipelines, and you still need your account factories with all that stuff in it. But in this case, now you can simplify it a little bit. If you empower maybe a centralized security account, which you'll see at the top right there, with the remediation, uh, lambda, uh, remediation lambdas and notification lambdas, you can set up like cross-account uh, CloudWatch rules from each of the individual accounts in the organization to say, hey, go kick off this event in the security account, have it come in, and go roll, and go roll with the remediation and the notification. It's really more about what, what you want to protect in case an account ever gets compromised. Cool. Oh my god, I'm running so fast. I don't have enough content. I'm going to talk by saying, I would love to come up here and tell you I'm the first one to think of this. But I'm not. This came up in 2015. There was a blog post on the AWS security blog. I just read it. And I said, team, can we build this? Right? If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Again, in the vendor hall, you're going to find a lot of commercial uh, things in the marketplace for that. I encourage you to go to open source to see what other folks have distributed out to the open source community to go see. For us, the future for us, for our warden tool, we're happy to announce that our intention to move it to open source and make it uh, extensible so you can add your own policies and set this up on your own. From the AWS side, <laughs> thanks. On the AWS side, uh, we're looking at what they can do for us, and they do amazing things. I don't think it'll ever remove this need for a compliance engine. But I think the things that AWS can do is make it simpler on that code to interpret, right? So when we start talking preventive guardrails, AWS Control Tower is a great start on that. It sets up service control policies and makes sure that those, those resources never get provisioned if they're misconfigured already in the code, right? We get things like uh, AWS Service Catalog, where if you don't want to give developers the freedom like we have to go build whatever they want, you want to give them standardized building blocks, Service Catalog will do that. Right? 
AWS organizations is great as well. If you have the multi-account strategy, you're able to put preventive controls in that, in that strategy to turn off services, whitelist them, blacklist them, whatever you have to do. And hopefully in the future, be able to do more fine-grained um, interpretations of what that means. On the events and sources side, I think they're just gonna continue with these great products like AWS Config, Trusted Advisor, Guard Duty, Inspector, Macy. These things are gonna be our new event sources. It's not just gonna be an API and CloudWatch. If, some, if a Trusted Advisor or Inspector finds a vulnerability on a server, why can I do an automatic event remediation on that? If Amazon Macy finds some PII on some bucket that may not be public, but maybe shouldn't be there, why can't I do an event, event auto healing on that? Perhaps move that file somewhere else, contain it, put a note there, notify our data governance group of what's going on. Why can't I do that? I can take this pattern of the security event bus using these cloud native tools and do so much more with it. Event visibility is gonna be key in the future. Uh, AWS Security Hub, which was announced as uh, gold, I believe, yesterday, uh, is going, uh, will allow us to see all this in a single dashboard. And then the next step, I think, is really gonna be the automated reasoning and the machine learning. I can't tell you how hard it is to code. Well, I, I didn't do a lot of the coding, and my engineers did, but I watched them struggle with how to interpret an S3 bucket policy line by line. There's got to be 500 million ways to write an S3 bucket policy. Zelkova is something behind the scenes that you can go, here's my standard policy. I want to feed it into what the user has delivered and go tell me if it's more permissive or less permissive. Based on all the other interactions that Zelkova has had across all buckets across all of AWS. Absolutely mind boggling. The other thing our development teams found out when we, in particular about S3, I really want to bring that up, was we never intended it to write S3 policies for them. So we would give them their policies and go, all right, here is your ensure encryption is turned on bucket policy. Here is your ensure the VPC endpoint so it never goes public policy. And they struggled to implement that. When we told them about the tool we made, the Warden tool, they first, the first developer, the very first one, and this is key, talk to your customer. In this case, it was our development teams, said, all right, so if I just tag the bucket appropriately and I give you a blank policy, your tool's just gonna fix it for me and write it for me. I don't have to worry about it. Like, yeah, I guess, yeah, that, that's how it would work. Why don't I just do that? Yeah, why, why, why don't you just do that? And that's what a lot of our developers do. They learn about the tagging policy, they tell them about how they tag the buckets, and our warden tool will write the policy for them. Our compliance, uh, our compliance groups have also taken that. They've been looking at the tags and understanding, hey, based on the type of data you, you have there, what level, of, what level of tagging do you need to have? Because they trust the warden tool to write, to write those policies correctly in a standardized way. All in all, we get some great things with this. I get behavioral data as well. If I have 1,500 developers and I'm gonna have the 10% that are advanced, awesome cloud evangelists, cloud developers, they're gonna do a great job of making sure things are done the right way. I'm gonna have the 90%. I'm gonna have that mainframe developer who's just trying to learn cloud. I'm gonna have that one guy who still wants to um, uh, run his Java applications and do everything the, old, the, the way, the traditional way he used to do it. We have a way now with the uh, logging we get out of Warden and the compliance tests to understand where our pockets of where the culture of practice has been raised versus the pockets in our enterprise where it hasn't. So now we can start focusing our more educational efforts of security in those areas as well, right? I can't scale that out to the whole enterprise. But what I can do is scale it out to the parts of the enterprise that really, really need it. So what, what other companies have done with this is this behavior analytics from their compliance tools in the cloud. They've done things like gamified security report cards. Start posting it, making it a game. Don't ever get hit by warden. If you have a warden hit, it's worth this many points, whatever it is, and gamify it. Make it a, a point of pride if your team never gets hit with warden, right? On the other side, we're looking, we could do things like, with the event response, we can do, uh, automate the intake on those development teams' uh, backlogs. 
right? Whether it's a request through some change management system or getting access to their actual backlog and dropping the story there. We can go, you were hit with Warden, we couldn't remediate for you, you need to go fix this right on your backlog, whatever priority it needs to be. Don't need to have a conversation with them, don't need to do any of that. Already in their work backlog, they'll get to it when they next look at their backlog. And what AWS is going to do, right? We made this tool a year and a half to two years ago. Back then, S3 didn't have a public tag, but they added one. So they start adding all these checkboxes. And what our warden tool will end up doing is just verifying that those checkboxes are checked. We're going to get, we're gonna simplify our security as code. We won't have to do a complicated stanza uh, interpretation of a bucket policy. I'll just be able to go check that one thing, that one item, that one configuration parameter on the bucket. So that's where we see uh, the, uh, this is what has really helped us move from a traditional uh, uh, configuration management program to an event-driven one. A public disclosure of data maybe takes us, based on SLA, a few days, we get it down, down, done in a matter of seconds. So with that, I thank you for your time, and I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of, uh, of the Reinforced Conference. Thank you.